Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry for the little bit of a late start this evening. We had a bit of a tech issue. Um, I'm just going to do a quick um, bit about the Upstart competition um, before we have our speaker of the night, which is David Pazika, and he's speaking on building an effective board. Um, so we talked about the Upstart competition in September. Um, we'll do maybe four or five slides just to talk about it again, because it is coming up in February. Um, just a general overview, it's a business pitch competition and it's open to the participants of Entrepreneurship 101. So it can be an individual or a team um, that, that uh, applies and in the pitch competition itself you, you would give a 10 minute presentation on your idea for a business. Um, entrants are ex expected to apply the concepts that they've learned from the course to their business idea and a prize of $10,000 will be awarded to the winner. This year we're adding um, a People's Choice Award and honorable mentions will, will also be awarded because we found that the, uh, the companies were really great and we wanted to give out more than one prize. So. Um, just about, a little bit about the eligibility. I've, I mentioned that you have to be enrolled in Entrepreneurship 101 online and you have to have attended 20 of the 30 lectures in person. Um, Mars does have a focus of the types of companies that we work with and those are the same companies that would be eligible for this competition. So, um, you have to have fallen into one of our four categories, which is um, ICT, the Information Technology Communications um, and Entertainment, which is why we call it ICE, Clean Tech, Social Ventures, or Life Sciences. And we do have uh, some parameters around um, investment and revenue levels. So you have to have received no more than $100,000 in investment money and have earned no more than $100,000 in cumulative revenue since your inception. So just a, a bit about sort of the overview of the competition itself. It happens in three stages. So the first stage is the application stage, and uh, that will be um, in January. So we uh, encourage everyone interested in applying for the competition to submit a three-page executive summary of your business idea by Friday, February 14th um, to Entrepreneurship 101 at MarsDD.com. Um, during February, um, we will um, go through all the applications and arrange for you to meet with a Mars advisor to sort of talk about your idea. And at the end of February, we will select 10 entrants to go on to the competition. So the second stage is, is for the 10 that have been selected to go on. Um, during March and April, you'll be working with Mars advisors or if, if you choose to by yourself to prepare for the pitch competition. Um, we'll also be offering special workshop series that we um, will help to prepare the, the participants, and they'll be announced next week, so we'll talk a little bit about them. They're open, there's one series that'll be open for everybody interested in applying, and a second series for the participants themselves. And then the third stage is the pitch competition itself. Um, it happens on May 20th. Um, each of the 10 participants gives a 10 minute pitch presentation to a panel of judges. We have a pretty well-rounded panel every year. It's probably a couple VCs, um, maybe an IP lawyer, and uh, a Mars advisor. And following your presentation, there's about five minutes of questions by the judges. We pick the winners the same day and we have a reception where we award the prizes. So um, we encourage actually everybody here to come. It's actually really neat to see some of the ideas that have come out of the people in this course. It's really inspiring. And if anybody's worried about confidentiality, it's a bit touchy, your business idea, you don't necessarily want it to be shared. Um, the pitch competition itself, everybody who attends signs an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, which basically says that they won't talk about the ideas. Um, and just a little bit about the criteria for judging. So here's some of the criteria that we'll be looking at both in the three-page summary and in the pitch competition itself. So basically, have you clearly articulated your value proposition? Actually, I should mention next week's uh, lecture is on value proposition, and it's given by one of my colleagues, Joe Wilson, who's a fantastic presenter, and he's, he's going to do a great job of that if you're unsure about what it is. Um, another one is, have you um, clearly demonstrated competitive differentiation, intellectual capital, IP? Have you demonstrated a business model that'll make money, or in the case of a social venture, will have the desired social impact? And uh, have you demonstrated market awareness? How effective was your actual presentation? And the investors will ask themselves, would they invest or back this opportunity? So there are three page um, documents about the Upstart competition that we will have. They're out this week and, and they will be out for the rest of the month. Um, we do have a website, I didn't put it on here, but um, just a note again about the submission deadline. Um, it's February, Friday, February 4th at 2011. And um, if you have any questions or concerns, please email us at the same address. 
And so now I would like to welcome Tony Redpath up to introduce our speaker. Okay, so good evening, folks. Um, governance, building effective boards. Um, I'm delighted to welcome David Pasika back to, to talk on this uh, subject. Uh, David is an advisor with us here at Mars in the ICE and cleantech practice, uh, but he also works out in Mississauga with the, uh, the RIC Center out there, um, one of the uh, regional innovation centers in Ontario. Um, David started off uh, with a degree in science, not chemistry, but close enough, general degree, uh, and then did an MBA. Um, I think what's relevant in terms of the training side, he uh, has taken the Chartered Director course in, in, uh, from McMaster, which is really um, a formal training on the roles, responsibilities of directors and, and boards of, of so forth. So he has domain expertise. Um, in terms of business, um, uh, you know, he's, uh, let's say, he has had a leadership role with uh, companies Bell, AT&T, Zero Footprint, uh, 724 Solutions, Algonquin Power. Um, he's um, just trying to remember on here on uh, the boards of, um, you know, I'm, I'm losing this here, um, uh, Oakville Hydro on the faculty of the Directors College. There we are. Um, you may ask, you know, I'm just starting out. Why do I need to know about boards and governance and all this exciting stuff? Let me tell you. Um, an investment of time understanding what to do now at the early stage will pay off big time by not making mistakes that will take you a huge amount of time to correct when you get bigger. And so um, I think it is really important to, important to understand the things that David's going to be talking about. Whether or not you deploy them now, at least you'll know what to do. Uh, and when you go public, it will be all smooth sailing. So uh, with that, uh, David, over to you. Thanks, Tony. Okay, good stuff. Thanks a lot, Tony. It's uh, delightful for me to be here and talk about one of my passions and one of my biggest passions in the last five years is learning and studying the whole uh, business of governance because good governance will make better companies will ultimately have fantastic results. And this is what I, this is what I study, this is what I believe and many in the, in, in the uh, industry would recognize that as the right sequence of events. Um, today, I'm gonna, I think it's the green button. Um, I'm gonna talk, uh, this is, uh, first of all, a great example of what not to use in your upstart presentation, okay? <laughs> so I wanted to get out there that this is not what you need to do, but I, f I came across this a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine uh, shipped it my way, and this uh, comes from a website which is in the back of the presentation, and you'll have a chance to go look. And this is something called uh, www.wallstreetfollies.com. And the, uh, the vintage of this chart is about 2002. And on the chart, once you, uh, once you could actually download it and take a closer look, you're gonna see WorldCom on there, you're gonna see Arthur Anderson on there, you're gonna see Enron, you're gonna see Martha Stewart, you're gonna see the, uh, the early stages of some failures at Bear Stearns, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this was a very fascinating chart, and you can look and follow the little dots and find out and remind yourself um, what happened in those particular cases. And they're listed as governance failures because in all cases, uh, where was the board and what happened? Subsequent to 2002, of course, a lot of things have changed. And we've got some other names, uh, Canadian names that would go up there, you know, including, unfortunately, Nortel, Hollinger, uh, Bear Stearns in the US, Lehman Brothers. We've got our own e-health problems here. So we have a number of examples that exist each and every day. And they all come back to some of the principles associated with 
how was the governance set up and how was it managed? So uh, my job here today really is you know, to kind of dig into the whys and specifically on the whys, try to give you a flavor for what happened there and more importantly, what you need to do about this as you think about growing your business and starting your business or operating your business. And today we're gonna to actually talk about a couple of things and I'll interchange them and I'll try to show you the difference between a board of directors and advisory board. And these are two very important structures for what you need to do and what you need to build. And many of the principles that I'm talking about here will apply to both of them. And that's why it, this whole issue of governance will actually come to your table a lot quicker than you might think. So you don't have to be a publicly traded company, for example, to have a board of directors. And you probably need an advisory board very, very quickly in your early stages of Genesis. So answering the questions, why, why, why? Why are these uh, very public, very popular, uh, very large brands falling over from a governance perspective? And a, a number of people have started to analyze these failures, and I reference a book in the back of my presentation that, I'm, uh, that, I, that I have uh, delight uh, reading, and you'll get a chance to read uh, about Mr. Gillespie. But you know, essentially, a couple of guys have studied the facts, and, and they basically boil it down to the following things. You know, the, the board really didn't know what management was actually up to, and that they were totally unaware of the finances of the organization. And so somehow they were veiled from all the things that were happening, even though they were technically there to uh, uh, oversee and supervise. So if you drill it down a layer deeper, you say, well, why could that be? And there's a couple of things that come to mind. You know, first of all, a lot of boards uh, rely on a, on a cycle that says we're uh, speaking, um, we're, we've got a, a cycle of so many board meetings a, a month, so many board meetings a year, and, and essentially, um, when the, uh, a director shows up to a, uh, a board meeting, they have a package in their hand, but um, that's essentially uh, most of the communication that they're getting from the company. So they're relying a lot on management. Um, many, of course, were only part-time at this, and as you'll find out, there are good directors and bad directors. Some of the best directors are the ones that are putting in five hours of prep time for every one hour of, of meeting, okay? And, uh, but the bad ones are showing up with the binder in hand to the board meeting and flipping through the document real time as the issues are being stressed. And I'll show you why that doesn't work very well. And of course, there are other examples, forceful CEOs. You know, we talk about perhaps Conrad Black as, as an example there, where a very passionate, strong-willed individual actually forcing things through the board. And you could see how those things could get, uh, get a little out of control. And, you know, more often than not, directors who aren't trained don't know what their job really is all about. And as a result, they're a little res reticent to rock the boat. It'd be, it's better for them not to say anything to, than to say something, so they think, but actually they're doing themselves a disservice and they're doing the company a disservice. Today we're gonna talk about a bunch of things. I hope to educate you a little bit on a whole vast array of topics, you know, provoke a little bit of thinking, and, and more importantly, provide you with some practical tools, things that you can do with your early stage company to get off on the right foot and start on the right foot, so that ultimately, you know, when you do make it through to an IPO, for example, you'll, be a, you'll have a very professional organization, and as a result, I can guarantee you superior results. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is a little bit of how the structure all fits together, and, and, and really, I tried to make it as simple. Uh, this is more like an upstart chart that you need to have. Very simple, few words on it, and a, and a little bit of a visual. So we're really talking about the corporation here, which is, which is created as a separate legal entity, and there are really kind of three parts to it. First of all, there are the shareholders, which you could equate to, quote, the owners. You know, then we have the board of directors, who, as you'll see later, are appointed by the shareholders to look after their best interests. And the last element would be the management, who would be hired by the board to actually execute the day-to-day. There's a fourth structure that we're gonna talk about, very relevant to everyone in the room, which is the advisory board structure. 
And typically, this is something that management would put into place. And uh, there are different uh, uh, things and associations associated with the advisory board and the board of director, and we'll, we'll absolutely uh, get into that. Just to uh, remind some of those folks in the room who are, who are not familiar, there's a couple of key linkages here. You know, so essentially, the shareholder uh, has a couple of duties. One, they appoint the auditor, if you will. And I'm talking about a publicly traded company in, in that particular case. Um, and, and they also elect the board of directors. The board of directors then decides how are they going to manage themselves. And they might set up a series of sub-teams, if you will, uh, committees that are very specifically focused on functional tasks. It could be an HR committee. There most certainly would be a finance or treasury uh, uh, function, and there's probably an HR function. Those are probably the three most common uh, that everyone must have uh, to start off. And then as things evolve and your board gets bigger and bigger and you're publicly traded and you're billions of dollars in assets, you probably have other committees like risk management committee or a special committee of the board to look at whether or not you should sell the business off to a, to a, to a competitor, et cetera. So those committees are crafted out of the board of directors. The board obviously uh, is hiring, uh, their, their mandate is really to hire the CEO. The CEO ultimately would look after uh, populating the rest of the management team. And some of our boards actually get quite involved with going maybe a layer down below the CEO and making sure that they understand what the talent pool looks like uh, at the corporation. Management, senior management ultimately would hire the rest of the team and this whole concept of advisory board could also be crafted out of the, uh, out of the, um, uh, from the management or the senior management. Um, this chart is a very telling chart, and I think I find this most powerful because it, it helps clarify the difference between a board of directors and an advisory on a couple of different levels and how things change over time. So the green line represents your advisory board. And if you go all the way to the left on the blue there, um, essentially that's when you, you start your company. And when you start your company, you're usually a single person and you have an idea. And how do you get to the next step? You usually surround yourself with a circle of family and friends. And I would call these advisors. These are your early stage advisors. That's a good idea, Bill. That's a horrible idea, Susie. I think that's crap of what we should start all over again. So you have essentially a, a, a number of people who are very influential in your early stage. And you build up your family and friends in your advisory boards to help get you launched. As, you, as time progresses though, the first thing that happens is you might decide that you might need to incorporate yourself. So here in Ontario, if you set up a numbered Ontario company, you have to declare a director on the forms. So your first director actually gets formed as soon as you set up that numbered company. And so you see the little blip in the, uh, in the chart there in the, in the orange as I add one director to the, uh, to the organization, and maybe it's yourself. Uh, but it also might be your, your father, your mother, your daughter, your sister, etc. And then um, a couple of things happening on the accesses. First of all, on the far left, uh, the access of the influence, okay? So the highest influence, family and friends, right at the beginning. But over time, that influence will fade away. And, and as you become, say, a publicly traded uh, or, um, uh, organization, um, think about where the line crosses there between the advisory and the board of directors. At that point, when you're publicly traded, there are certain rules and regulations that say you need so many directors and some of those directors need to be independent of the organization. In other words, you can't have your friend and, and, your, and your daughter and your dad on the board uh, in a publicly traded entity. So you can see that over time, the influence of your advisory board will go down to a certain level and plateau out. Um, even companies like um, uh, Sun, uh, you know, or um, New, uh, Novell or whatever, they all keep an advisory board structure in place to help them understand customer issues. But over time, as your stage grows, your financing grows, and time goes on, the board of directors becomes a stronger influence in what you do. 
couple of uh, key things. Now, this applies a little bit more to the board of directors, so not so much on the advisory side. Two very key duties associated with a, with a, a board member. One is a, a fiduciary duty, okay, and I've got the words here. I'll just read them for those at the back who might not be able to. To act in the best interests of the corporation. It, it's this notion that all stakeholders must be considered. And let me just show you what I mean by a stakeholder. So if this is the corporation in the middle, the stakeholder view says it's, it could be employees, could be the legislators, it, could, it, it will include your shareholders for sure, might include your NGOs, okay, um, your competitors, your bankers, etc. That is the ecosystem under which the stakeholders are there. And so as board members, it's your fiduciary responsibility to look after the best, inter the best interest of the corporation and the concept of the stakeholders, not the shareholders per se. The shareholders are part of the stakeholders, but a subset of them. This is, di this is uh, firmly grounded in Canadian law. In US law, it's slightly different. In US law, the board's fiduciary accountability is to the shareholders. So here in Canada, we, we recognize a wider circle of friends, if you will. The other duty the board has is to, is to exercise care, diligence, and skill that a reasonably prudent man would exercise under comparable circumstances. So to stay out of trouble, to stay out of legal hot water, you know, facts in, decide what you're gonna do with the facts that you've presented, make a decision that would be prudently the same as someone else looking at the same facts. If you do that, you'll stay on side. Three key director functions. Um, and these are very, very simple. So you think, wonder why all, we have all this trouble. First one is hire and fire the CEO. Seems simple enough. Second one is review and re approve. Not make up the strategic plan, but review and approve. Very interesting dis dis uh, distinction here that the management and the corporate, the management of the corporation are actually building out the strategic plan and wrapping the board in as appropriate to look at it, to, to pick at it, to make some suggestions, to amend it, and then ultimately approve it. And then the last uh, key function is, is monitoring the performance of management to make sure that they're doing all the right things. So how do boards do that? The tools are very simple. Three key tools. Information, okay? So, and here, um, very important, and the onus is back on you as management to provide your board with the right amount of information. What's the right amount? It depends. It, it really depends on the situation. But it, to, in order for the director to do his job, he needs to have some key information. He needs to know what the trends are. He needs to know what the, the, the numbers are. Oh, and guess what? You know, leads to the next process. We need to have a process so that you can give me the information in a timely manner so that I can absorb it and understand what it is you're trying to say. So I can look at your recommendation and, and think about it and try to add my value. And then the third one is, you know, I've got uh, as a qualified or as an experienced business leader or board member, I can bring lots to bear. I can bring my business judgment to the table. Oh, I remember doing that in another company. Oh yes, we used to have that trouble before, so here's what we did. You know, and you make some guidance and some suggestions to, the, to management to help them move along. So those are the three key tools. And as management, you'll find that when you first get your first official board, um, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, a shock for you because they're gonna start to ask a whole pile of questions. And uh, you're gonna think that they wanna get into your, uh, into your sock drawer. Uh, but really, what they're trying to do is they're trying to do their job so that they can stay on the right side of the law. And they're exercising the three tools that they have, uh, you know, information, process, and judgment and, and to, to make those choices. This is an interesting concept. And, and, I, and I think, you know, this is important to understand that not all boards and again, we're talking about boards of directors, are created equal. Depending on their stage and their time and how they came about, 
there's a different relationship between management and the board and how active the board is and how active management is. And we've got sort of two ends here, and I call this the, the, the bright red line. And when, we, when I'm consulting with <clears throat> early stage companies and, and for that matter, experienced boards, I try to bring them back to this chart to say, where do you think we are as a company on this, on this continuum? Are we down in the very active micromanagement arena where we're actually making all the decisions and choices? Or are we at the very top where whatever management gives us, we just put a stamp on it and, and send it through? Now, what's the correct answer? Well, the correct answer is, unfortunately, it depends. And it depends on a lot of factors. But, uh, you know, best governance practice would suggest that we need to move rubber stamp boards closer to the center and we need micromanaged boards to move closer to the center. So the answer is somewhere in between is where we ultimately want to go from a good governance perspective. Okay? And that gives the right balance between what management does and what the board's all about. Um, one of the things that Tony talked about earlier was just thinking about the, being a publicly traded company. And when I consult with some early stage companies, I often pull out the guidelines associated with the TSX. And I, I typically pull out the venture exchange stuff, but it doesn't really matter. They're all listed on the uh, on Ontario Securities Commission's website. But you could actually look, there is this particular report called the uh, National Instrument 58101, outlines what boards need to report back to the OSC on what they're doing in, in governance. And we need, and boards need to, for example, in TSX companies, need to talk about the composition of the board, how many people, um, what are the relevant backgrounds and experience, how many people are independent of management. In other words, sitting over here, you know, not fa uh, friends and family of the CEO. What's their education? What's the plan for the company to educate these people and keep these people current moving forward, et cetera? So this is a very interesting, you know, I, I picked this one out. You could just Google in National Instrument 58101 and it'll pull up a simple four-page document and say those are the kinds of things that TSX companies are accountable to report to the, to the OSC. And that might be an interesting and a, and a simple way of saying, there's what the benchmark should be for my company. And, and I'm gonna start moving towards that as a best practice. But I've, I've grown and started many, many startups myself and taken a couple of them through to IPO. And I know that it's a balance between over process and quick moving nimble. So, it, you know, I think it's just be aware of this, understand that that's a goal and figure out when it's the right time for you to start putting a little bit more discipline into, into what you do. I often consult uh, with a number of uh, early stage companies on how do you build these boards? And this applies uh, to uh, both uh, advisory boards and board of directors because the concepts are the, are the same. And, and the concept is start with the end in mind. Where do I want to take this company? What is it going to look like in two years or three years? Or where am I aspiring? What's my vision for what this thing's going to look like? That will define what your end game looks like. And then kind of step back from there and say, who do I have on my board today? If I don't have anyone, then maybe I need to figure out um, who to initially populate it with. And, and maybe you need an, a finance person to start. And maybe you need someone who knows the industry inside and out. There's a couple of key kind of early stage board members that you might put in place. But it, it really depends on um, where, what stage you're at, where you want to be, and, and the kinds of places uh, and the kinds of experience that you bring to the table. So I encourage people to kind of drop out a matrix, if you will, and say, from a functional expertise, do I have a guy on the board who knows a little bit about legal? Do I have a guy on the board who knows my industry sector space? Do I have a guy or, a, or sorry, a woman, a guy, I'm using them interchangeably. Um, do I have a person on the board 
you know, who's been there and done it, has taken an early stage company all the way through to, uh, to an IPO, which is what I want to do with my company. And so you, you basically would create a matrix, and I'll give you a reference at the end of the presentation on where you can go find that matrix. It's very simple, but it's a functional cut, if you will, of of uh, what you need, and you, and you think about populating around the kitchen table, you know? <clears throat> One thing I, I, I would like to stress is it's also about chemistry, too, because to a certain degree, when the times get tough, and I've sat on some, some boards where we've actually had to take them into CCAA, you want to be um, with the best Co most competent, energized individuals who are willing to throw their body at the problem. And so I, I want to stress too, it's not just about picking, you know, you know, the right person or the highest profile person that you can get on the board. You want to have, build and, and think about the chemistry and the culture of that board. Because when the times do get tough, and every early stage company will have some tough times, you want to make sure that they're there for you consistently. So I'd also stress, I add another piece there, it said chemistry is also important too. So it's not just he's the only guy I could get or she's the only woman I could get. You know, you want to think about populating with the best technical and also the, the people that you'd like to you know, be there to support you when, when times go a little rough. So um, a lot of people say, well, how do I get people on my advisory board or my, mo or my uh, board of directors? And here's a couple of things that you know, would motivate people to want to join you. First of all, you might initially um, you know, be able to tap your family or friends or a, or a colleague, and they might just do it as a favor to you. Now, that's, that, that's okay, um, as long as it fits in with your ultimate model and, and they fill an important role or an important seat at the, uh, at the table. Some people like to get involved from a status perspective. If you're in a hot space, for example, oh, I'd love to get into the wireless and, and, um, and, the, uh, and, the, health, and the healthcare uh, industries, and that will look good on my resume. So some people like to think of these board appointments as, as resume builders. As long as you understand what their motivation is, you can work with that. Um, some people like the work. Oh, that's a very interesting research project. And to take that to commercialization, that's fascinating. That's what I'd like to do. And so, you know, ferreting out those individuals will be, will be kind of important. Some use it as an opportunity to network within their space. Uh, in the case of not-for-profits, and there might be some not-for-profit uh, 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 entities in the room, some like to give back and feel like they're, uh, they're doing their, their, their for the community. Um, some like to have some fun, and more often than not, some people also say, hey, if I'm going to put my body and throw my shoulder at this, is there a little bit of remuneration? And there's lots of ways you can do that. You can do that with some cash or some stock options. Most people in the room wouldn't have extra cash to give to their board, but sometimes uh, stock options might be a useful way of doing it. Uh, another way might be just uh, organize a quarterly dinner at your house and, uh, and buy them a nice bottle of wine. So there's lots of ways that you can reward your board without having to pay big bucks. So here's the risk for the board members. I think it's important to understand that there are risks for board members. On advisory board members, totally different. They don't have, you know, they can't be uh, brought to jail or, uh, or, or charged, if you will, because they're advisors to you. So there's no um, fiduciary accountability for advisors. But the pure board of directors guys, uh, you know, do have a problem. They are joint and severally liable for the actions of the corporation. And especially it comes into play if the company goes out of business and goes into bankruptcy, becomes insolvent. You know, because the board members could actually be on the hook for payments to employees and unfortunately payments to the government, could you imagine? Uh, and potentially some payments to creditors. So there is risk to be on a board of directors. And, um, and so that, that's important to understand. So advisory board, not so much, ri no risk, really. And at board of directors, some risk associated with it. That's where perhaps the compensa compensation comes into play. Um, if you're on a board, though, you have a couple of mechanisms, mechanisms to defend yourself against risk. 
Um, we talked about the fiduciary duty. In other words, are you looking after the, the best interests of the corporation? Um, we talked about the duty of care. So are you doing what a prudent man would do given all the facts? You know, are you, um, are you uh, making a, a, a business judgment that was appropriate at the time? It doesn't have to be the right one, but at the time with the facts presented, you said, let's go left. Maybe left was totally into the, into the ditch, but um, with the facts that were presented, you know, that was the right choice at that time. And, and the court would look at that as you took the right judgment given what you had to work with. And the last two defenses would be there might be a little bit of an indemnity that the company could put wrap around the directors. And there's also something called director and officer uh, liability insurance. Um, I thought this was cute. Uh, this, is, uh, this is from uh, The Art of the Start, which of course is one of the required readings for uh, everyone in the room, I guess. Um, uh, guy Kawasaki uh, put together a little book, um, uh, an ex-Apple uh, guy, uh, venture capitalist, and this is a great read for those who haven't read it. But he said, you know, if you're thinking about advisory boards, I want to have a customer, which is obviously someone who understands the customer need. I want to have a geek. You know, someone who can actually figure out if we can technically do what, we're, what we need to do. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong chart. There we go. That's why everyone's looking at me strange. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate that. Um, you want me to start over again? Art of the start? No, okay. Um, you know, you want to have a dad, a dad or father or mother figure, someone who's a calming influence, if you will, and a wealth of experience that they can bring to the table. You want to have that tight ass, which is usually the person grounded in the finances, usually. And then, of course, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jerry Maguire, Mr. Connections, if you will. So that was his little view of the five key roles of building an advisory uh, board. Um, it, most important, of course, is once you've got your board, advisory or board of directors, how are you going to manage them? And, and uh, it's important, okay, to start off on the right foot. And so let's say you've organized your first board meeting and it's next week. You've got to over-prepare for that meeting. You've got to walk in there and, and maybe more often than not, you should pre-circulate the materials. They should understand all they can about your company and what it is you're trying to do. Whatever document you have, you should drop ship to their house so that they have the appropriate reading to understand what you're struggling with. I'm a big believer this applies a little bit more to the board of directors, but it also could apply to the, uh, to the advisory of creating a charter. What do you want the advisor to do? What is the expectation? You join my board, I, you know, I've got four meetings a year, plus a, a strategic retreat, plus a, two or three calls a, uh, a month. If you set that expectation, expectation at the front end, believe me, you'll get better performance out of it. You'll get less sleepy directors because they know at the front end that they signed a little piece of paper that said, that's what, I, that's what you expect of me. Other things that drive us all crazy is meeting management, sending materials out in advance, telling us what you want in advance, don't surprise us, um, etc. Taking minutes, having agendas, um, and then an in-camera, which we'll talk about in a couple of seconds. And I think the, la the second to last one's very important, which is give me something to do. If you ask me to sit on the board, you had a reason. And so make sure I have some homework, you know? And I said yes, and I said yes, you know, because you said there would be five or six meetings plus a little bit of homework and some, and some phone calls. So put me to work, come on. Um, best practice? Evaluating performance, because we, we get a lot of dead head. You know, you, you build the boards in the, in, in the best cycle, but you do get a lot of dead wood, unfortunately. It's, uh, it, it just happens. So my best practice is right off the get-go, for your advisory board and your board of directors, do a little bit of um, evaluation to avoid these four types of uh, profiles that I've, uh, that I've collected over the last little while. The first one's uh, what I call the masthead member. Really proud to be on that board, but you know what? Has really poor attendance, never shows up. When I phone, I can never get an answer, never returns my calls. But boy, he likes the fact that he, he on his resume, on his Facebook uh, page, it said that he's on the board of directors of Wireless Inc. And so he's using me more than I'm using him. Silent, run silent, run deep. 
um, the ones who show up at the meeting and actually don't say anything. They're processing, they're thinking, why did you even bother coming if you're not actually gonna ask me any questions or offer any opinions? And then we get the odd personality challenge, you know, the one who wants to dominate the place and that happens everywhere. And then the last one is a little bit of poison and some people, believe it or not, join boards for the wrong reasons. In some cases, they join the boards to see how they can advance their own personal career or their own pop pocketbook. So those are sort of four personality traits that uh, they're quite common and I throw the, them out there just to say, watch out. Uh, and these are a couple of reasons, these are a couple of telltale signs that you've got some of those uh, Deadwood guys, you know, people are showing up at meetings not prepared, there's not a lot of dialogue, not a lot of discussion. When you make a phone call, you have, you need them to weigh in and you can't get an answer. So, uh, so those are important signs. Um, one of the key best practices is to constantly assess the performance of your board. And very sophisticated boards like the CIBC, for example, would actually bring third party observers into their board meetings and watch the dynamic and run a sort of simulations and they would do sort of follow up work with the board to try to get the engagement and the participation up. But for everyone in the room here, you know, you, you probably have to start at the top, which is the cheap and cheerful side. And, and essentially, you could easily do board assessment on your advisory board and your board of directors. How many meetings did you have this month or this quarter or this year? How many people showed up? How many people stayed to the end? Um, every meeting could have a for the good of the board uh, concept to it. Very, very simple. At the end of the meeting, you know, we, we can do it two ways. We can do it verbal. We wander around the table and say, okay, everyone's got 20 seconds. Tell us what you liked about it, what you hated about it. Areas we need to improve. And you go around the table, quickly gather that information and then try to make the next one that much better. The other thing I've seen done very cheap and cheerful is a survey. It's got essentially five questions on it. And it asks, you know, these five questions and it's got a scale of one to five and it's on a piece of paper. And you just basically drop the piece of paper on and everyone has to circle the five answers before they walk out of the room. Hand that off to the chair of the meeting and guess what? You know what you need to do for next time. And these are so easy to do uh, and could be done at the advisory level, at the board level. And believe me, you're gonna look like a, a superstar CEO or president of an organization by putting these simple things in place and, and your performance would absolutely go up. Uh, and then, you know, back to, there's, uh, you know, the boards that I sit on right now, uh, we are doing peer surveys. So we, we talk about who's, who's good and who's bad. And, uh, and we work with the board to ensure that, uh, the board chair to ensure that the people who aren't participating are, are being told they're not participating. And we try to figure out how to uh, uh, silently move them off the, uh, off the mark. Um, so, um, in summary, um, I think I, uh, I covered a number of uh, pieces here. Uh, I tried to jam in um, things that were both relevant to provide you uh, with a little bit of background on what the corporation's all about, you know, the duties of the directors, how to build advisory boards and boards of directors. And then the last uh, part of the presentation was about managing your board, managing expectations, managing charters, and then ultimately putting that best practice stamp of evaluating and continuous improvement. And to me, these are the principles. These are the core principles of a very effective, high performing board uh, of directors and board of advisory. And you put those principles in place. And you can see they're very simple. Uh, you put those in place and you'll have a superior performing uh, organization. Uh, my last chart um, is really a couple of the reference books that I use. These are, these are fairly easy, they're pretty modern uh, to find. You can get a lot of this stuff off the internet. Uh, but these are uh, a couple of key books that kind of bring these concepts to date. And there's the wallstreetfollies.com. They've got some other fun t-shirts on their, on their website, etc. And the one that I really love right now is the Money for Nothing, How the Failure of uh, Corporate uh, Boards is Ruining America Business, et cetera, et cetera. And some really insight uh, case studies into some of the companies that fell over and how poorly managed they were at the board level uh, and some very interesting insights there. So uh, with that, uh, I believe I have completed 
most of my time, and uh, I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Yes. I got the mic on. <laughs> Hi. When it comes to advisory boards, what's yeah. appropriate to ask them to do? Yeah, and um, uh, I, I think it, it would depend on your stage, but um, I would think... Um, and it depends on also whether you think you're going to compensate them or is it complete volunteer time. Um, but I would suggest that um, it's probably not, uh, I just did one of these for a client and they, uh, they suggested that uh, there would be kind of two to three hours of phone consultation a month and quarterly meeting and, uh, and, a, and maybe a strategic re retreat that might take all day. And uh, my CEO wrote that out and, uh, and passed it around in, and they got very positive response from that. But it would depend on your situation. Obviously, uh, knowing startup, you know, you've got lots of stuff, You're on, your hair's on fire. So, uh, so you might need more of a, uh, you know, more uh, involvement early stage. And then at that point, you might wanna think about uh, how you would potentially look at options as a, as, a, as a way of sort of providing some remuneration um, or, or, or some other way of making it interesting uh, for, your, uh, for your potentials to join. Yes, sir. Yes, I'd be interested if you could just uh, go into a bit more detail of uh, director's fiduciary responsibility to other stakeholders yes. other than shareholders. Yeah. And I guess... Uh, Priority to that is how you mentioned directors having a responsibility to creditors. Yes. So on the first one, a very famous case, uh, just uh, in the last couple of um, uh, a couple of years, which was the uh, BCE bondholders. So essentially, um, if you remember, going back a couple of years ago, the uh, the board of directors decided that they would. Uh, they would make uh, some investments, which ultimately gave the uh, the bondholders in BCE uh, a bit of a haircut, and uh, they took the case up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ultimately ruled that um, yes, you have shareholders. That would have been a good thing for the shareholders, but your bondholders are stakeholders, and under our Canadian uh, uh, framework, of course, uh, you would have to um, you would ha you have to. It is your uh, your accountability to make sure that you are looking after all groups. So in other words, you have to consider the fact that it was good for bondholders, uh, uh, sorry, it was, it was good for uh, shareholders and bad for uh, bondholders, um, and you have to factor that into your decision-making process. You might, you, know, you might still land on the fact that you're going ahead with the, with the thing, but through your due diligence, no, we looked at both sides of the coin, and. Uh, the overarching in the best interests of the corporation, it was best to maybe give the bondholders a little bit of a haircut and, uh, and the shareholders obviously win. So that's, that's a, a real live case, a real live example up to the Supreme Court and there of course uh, are, are others. Uh, with regards to the creditors, it, it, it's a little bit fuzzier there. Clearly there are those things that we talked about which is, uh, you know, essentially statutory requirements for, you know, payroll, payroll tax, uh, and, and many early stage companies and either later stage companies actually have a certification that's done by the CFO or the CEO saying, yes, and we are current with all our remittances to the, uh, uh, to the government for payroll taxes and UI and, and all that good stuff. And usually those are circulated to the board uh, so that they can feel comfortable that they're not at risk. Um, individual creditors, usually there's a little bit of a veil protecting. I, I threw that up there because there might be some circumstances where creditors have an opportunity to come back through into the board, but the key ones are the government. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, it's very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, I have a question about how to become like uh, one of those independent board members, like in a 
corporation, like how to start it, or is it going like by recommendation, or and beside that, sort of, sort of how how would you get yeah, your independent how, how to get, member? You know, like um, yeah. So when you initially incorporate, you know, you could put your name as the as the director on the uh, on the Ontario Inc. Uh, uh, filing. And, and essentially, uh, you can run your corporation with you and your family and friends and your brother and your sister, et cetera, for quite some time. Yeah. At, at, at one point, when you attract external funding, and a good example here is that the IAF fund, um, you know, the, um, the investment accelerator fund that they, that they manage upstairs, as soon as that external funding comes into the corporation, in order to give Tony and, and the rest of the Mars uh, organization comfort that the money is going to be managed appropriately, they are demanding that you put an outside independent onto your board. How, is that typically, how does that typically happen? It's usually, um, you know, Tony and his investment gang might actually recommend somebody that you don't know. Or the other thing is you might mutually interview a couple and then pick. Okay, so, uh, but ultimately, the, the person with the money is making the golden rules, and the okay. rules said, hey, I don't want, I want my money well managed uh, once it goes into the corporation for the purposes under which you said, and how do I feel comfortable about that? I make sure that I have a person who is completely independent of the business or the existing okay, management. The second question would be like, how, how you track those board members, like, how do you what? Uh, is Sorry. There, is there any prerequisite like being uh, not bankrupt, being sane? <laughs> because there are some. some yes. Yeah. There are there are some restrictions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, and you would have, especially um, for a publicly traded entity, you know. So for example, um, because I was a director of a company that we took, you know, through CCAA in an insolvency. I have to carry that on my profile saying that I was a director of this company that went into insolvency. And I have to carry that, I think, on my profile for 10 years. And so it's part of the disclosure. When I sign up to be a board member of a publicly traded company, I have to declare what's happened in the past. And you know, the, the OSC, for example, ha has to look at that form and ultimately approve it. And so if they see a track record, for example, of, you know, um, directors who are always attached to bankrupt companies, okay, that, that will be a red flag. And guess what? Your, your insurance company who would provide DNO insurance would probably say, uh-uh, I'm not insuring your company, or if I am, I'm insuring it with premiums through the roof because clearly you don't have a track record of success. Um, but you know, as, many thing, as, as many people know, companies fail for lots of different reasons and it's not just about boards. And fascinating, in this particular case when we took that company into bankruptcy, there were a number of, of board members who were so concerned about their profile that they, they resigned. And, uh, and that's the exact wrong time to resign from a board of directors because that's the time the company needs the wisdom and the experience of the board members to figure out how to work through the next couple of months. And so, uh, you know, once you're in, you're in and you're in for the duty. Thanks for your question. <clears throat> Hi, my question goes to uh, what is the guidance for uh, the time the, the directors can be in the corporation. And what I mean by that is that yeah. the- Terms or something, Yeah, right? terms and yeah. given the evaluation process that you explained, yep. so you may have found that one director is, is not suitable anymore. Right. So how do you fire a director? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating, right? So a couple things, uh, terms, on terms um, for directors or for advisories. Um, I'm, I'm suggesting on the advisory board, when you, when you create that little contract, if you will, on expectations for your advisory board, you might put a little, you might give yourself a little bit of flexibility by saying, this is a one-year agreement or this is a two-year advisory term. So I might put an advisory term on your, on your advisors. Why? Because you don't know, especially if you're going to give them some money or some options to be there, because you're not really sure what you're going to get. On the board of directors, however, um, slightly different approach. Um, 
you know, typically uh, there, there are two schools of, of thought. One is there's a term out there, so it's a two-year, three-year, or five-year term, and we see that. But more, more importantly now, at the, at the board of directors levels, remember we're talking about experience here, um, there's a tendency not to put a term on a board of director. Um, uh, why? Because as long as they're performing and adding their value, okay, they could be 70 or 75 years old, and if they're still adding value, that's a good thing for your company, okay? The second part of your question was, how do you get rid of them? And it's a very tricky thing because if you remember, the, the shareholder is basically approving the board, of the board. And so that's usually done on an annual meeting. And so what we do uh, and, uh, is we go through this process of evaluation. Everyone around the table knows who's contributing and who's not contributing. That's really obvious. But um, then what you do is you, get, you engage the chair of the board to have a private one-on-one -on -one conversation and say, the feedback from your peers is not that good, and uh, we don't think you're pulling your weight. And just like good performance management, you try to have a rational conversation there. Technically, the chair cannot fire a board member, but when the annual meeting comes up, if the guy refuses to leave under his own uh, steam, if you will, um, you know, the, uh, the board wouldn't put forward a slate or management wouldn't put forward a slate that would include that individual's name. So it's a tricky thing, but typically people who aren't contributing know they're not contributing, and typically no, everyone, no one wants to lose face by being sort of ceremonially pushed off the board. So usually there's a, a delicate balance that the chair is able to bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, who's up first? Uh, ladies first, I, I guess? Yeah, I can go. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to know, how do you uh, minimize friction between a board of directors and the management? Yes. And if it arises, how do you deal with it? Yes. Um, well, a couple things. Uh, first of all, um, you should, if you, so we have a board structure. Uh, the board structure should typically have a chair, a chair of the board. And that could be, um, uh, and it shouldn't be the CEO of the corporation, okay? So usually that chair is elected um, by a simple vote, perhaps, by, or, a, or a sealed vote uh, by the rest of the board. So the key is putting a strong chair into the, uh, into the seat. And, and that chair understands, remember back to my bright red line, you know, rubber stamp board, micromanage board. The friction usually occurs when you're not really understanding where that thing is and where you ultimately wanna, wanna get it to. So in, in my way, uh, I think the chair becomes the impartial, if you will, and if the board and the, and the, uh, and the CEO are, are butting heads, the chair usually takes the accountability to work that, you know, a little bit in the public form, but also a little bit in the private form. So pulls the CEO off to one side, maybe pulls the individual director off to one side and said, hey, um, you know, we've got to make this work. You know, we're in the boat together, you know, kind of thing. Is that helpful? Yep. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, David. Um, we talked earlier about the shortcomings of an uneducated board. Yeah. Um, and we can obviously extend that notion to um, an uneducated board of advisors. Yep. And when you're just starting out, um, you're sort of handcuffed in the sense that yep. you can't get that all-star cast Absolutely. of advisors and you're getting mom and dad or yep. your brother and sister. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with mom and dad or your sisters. Not, you know, Ex exactly. But yeah. how much stock are you putting in the, into their decisions to sort of direct your company when you're just starting out? Well, um, I think everyone, uh, of the, everyone who puts their hand up to say, I want to help your company out, you know, has a, a genuine and sincere interest to, be able to want to do that. But what you'll recognize is they all, they'll only be able to take it so far. So for example, uh, uh, we see it all the time uh, through the IAF fund here. A lot of the companies that come through for funding, the CEO got them, got them to this point is not the CEO is going to take them to the you know the five to ten million dollar range, and it's a tough conversation that you have to have with that CEO to say, 
you know, you did a great job to date, thank you very much, but you're not the one to take it because you don't have the depth and the breadth of experience. So the same on the, on the advisor. You start out with your mom and dad and your, and, and your family and friends and the best people that you can surround yourself with. And, and, um, and, and I would talk it up, I would network it up. Where do you get board uh, advisor guys? Um, you know, if, if you're looking for an industry specialist, for example, you're, you're watching, you're going to the conferences and the trade shows and you're listening who, to who's speaking and you're making comments, you know, and, and you're, you're tracking the gurus. And you saw my list of what motivates people to join you, there, you might be able to hit one or two of those things. The best source that I, that, uh, I, uh, I, I found uh, a couple of years back was sometimes in your, in your community, the, um, let's say, the municipal government or the economic development office might actually be able to give you a wider breadth and depth of, of experienced people. And let's say your, your, your business is in healthcare, for example, then maybe pick off um, and phone the VP of HR at AstraZeneca and say, I've got this early stage company, we're in this space, we're trying to do this, and I am looking for someone to sit on my board who can help me move it along. And I bet you'll find that that HR individual is accountable for you know, performance management and succession planning and performance of those high performing uh, individuals who will be the next CEOs. And so they might actually have a stable of one or two names who, who would they, they would be willing to offer up as volunteers for your company. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, there are some countries that have legislated uh, gender quotas on boards. Mm. Can you talk a bit about the importance of gender diversity? Absolutely. It, it, it's a very important issue. And, and uh, I applaud here the City of Toronto, for example, in, in an initiative that they kicked off. Uh, from what I could see in the, in the research I did, probably in the early 2000s. And essentially, they have a number of boards and advisory boards and commissions that need to get put together. And, and what they do is they, uh, they look at the population, okay? So let's say it's, uh, it's transit here in Toronto, hot topic obviously, and they need to set up an advisory panel. It, typically what the city of Toronto does is actually it looks at its population profile, and I believe the last time I checked, they're, they're, they're measuring, you know, um, uh, different, um, um, Obviously, you know, male and female, but they're also tracking gay and and uh, and um, and uh, in a number of uh, visible minorities in a number of different uh, categories. So they know what the population of the city of Toronto looks like in a whole pile. I think it's about 35 categories. And if this is a board or advisor panel that is to represent the city of Toronto, then clearly you want to make sure that it closely matches the population under which you're serving. So that's how the city of Toronto is doing that, and many boards are actually taking that guidance under underway. Uh, so th that is definitely, you know, it's, it's not as, le it's, it might be legislated a lot in government work, but it's not necessarily in private corporation work. But, but I would use the, what is the corporation all about? Who is, the, who is the population that they're serving? And I try to build a board that is representative of that group. Is that helpful? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.